Dust to Dust, Chapter 10, First Part I won't say that I was caught off guard, said Baron Gildy. I was bested by your true power. Even now my throat burns like fire. How fortunate for me that I have an opportunity to avenge myself here. D. Can you prevent my attacks when I am beyond the range of your blade, or your needles you throw? There was no answer. Long ago, when you destroyed this island, I didn't do battle with you or even know your name, as the flames engulfed me while I slumbered. Who would have thought the very day I was transferred to the island would be the day of its destruction? But now I'm overjoyed to have had the chance to battle you not once, but twice. I know not whether you are bold, or just dull-witted, venturing defenseless into a noble base as you have. It was the same last time, the hunter replied. His voice, like holy winter's night, made Gildy's expression stiffen. I see. And this time, too, you will see us all destroyed. Such confidence. However, I will remind you that last time you didn't fight me. You said it yourself just now. I bested you. The Baron's body rose vertically. One of the cylinders made a faint mechanical buzz. Abnormal conditions were broadcast into the space around D. The instant the hunter kicked off the dirt, the ground in a six-foot diameter area around where he'd been standing suddenly vanished. Or rather, it had been compressed by an incredible increase in gravity. Not only could the four cylinders negate gravity, but they were also designed to be used as weapons. Creating a force field that could compact things down to the atomic level. The ground that had subsided had been reduced to ash to a depth of six miles. The hunter wouldn't be able to dodge a second attack. On landing, Dee drew a sword and hurled it at the airborne baron in all in a single motion. The duel was taking place across a thousand yards. When Baron Gildy saw Dee's right arm sweep around, a mocking sneer rose on his lips. He'd already risen another five hundred yards. It was a futile attempt. Gildy's mocking sneer became a look of pity. At the same time the gravity controller in front of him had shaken faintly, something cold and hard had sunk into his heart. The gravity controllers would probably have him at the edge of the atmosphere in no time, though its undead pilot had already been reduced to dust. Looks like I made it in time, the hoarse voice said feebly from the chest of the hunter's black coat. A millisecond more and you would have been crushed down to the size of an atom. But now that you've lost your weapon, you're in a bit of a dilemma as to what to do next, huh? Even before the hoarse voice noticed, Dee had turned his face slightly toward the rear. The direction he'd encountered Meg. The girl's fighting the good fight, eh? Well... Nothing to worry about in your present position. On the other hand, what'll you do if it comes down to that? Oh, I suppose you'd probably finish her off without raising an eyebrow. Before the voice had even finished speaking, Dee turned his face toward again and started off, the wind whipping in his wake. Page break indicated by a small cross. The mechanism for opening and closing the door was immediately to the right of the section of wall that had changed color. That Meg understood. Slipping through it without meeting any resistance, she stepped into a vast room. Though there was no illumination, Meg's eyes could make out a half dozen figures lying on the ridiculously broad expanse of floor. Togo's little boy, Shokin's wife, and old Mang Ong. Familiar faces were right there. Anger ensnared Meg. Old folks and kids had been thrown in there without a single bed, and left to sleep on the floor. And that was no way for anyone to treat a human being. 
Togil's boy was the closest to her, but before Meg bent down over him, she first checked her own teeth. They poked into her fingertip painfully. It seemed it would be best to talk as little as possible. A desolate wind blew through the girl's heart. After a look at his throat to confirm there were no marks there, Meg called out to the little boy, who woke up immediately. Telling him not to say anything, she woke the other villagers. There were twenty of them. They were all that remained. All the rest had stained these blade. Resisting the urge to crumble, Meg led the people outside. She planned to hide them in the forest for the time being and get them on the move again with the coming of daybreak. Fleeing through the night would be akin to running into the nobility's arms. But Meg also didn't know whether or not she herself would be able to act once the sun came up. It seemed highly unlikely. At any rate, she'd get them away from there, and once they'd reached somewhere the nobles wouldn't find them, she'd have them split up and make a break for the bay each on their own, as the girl was leading the villagers toward the exit. Her charges still half days since waking, she got the feeling something cold had hit her back, so she halted. They were blinking in darkness. She didn't need to count them to know exactly how many there were. I'm too late, right? Meg murmured. Something in her heart crumbled. When we become like the nobility, the marks on our throats disappear, Togil's son said. It happened with all of us. You can be one of us too, miss. Meg sensed the throng suddenly closing in, hard hands latched onto her arms. Old man Ong, the girl said in a worn, threadbare voice. Age before beauty, as I say. Would you let me have a mouthful? Of your warm blood, that is. A number of hands touched her shoulders, pulled at the cuffs of her sleeves. Everyone wanted it. They all asked for a share, even if it were just a little. Everyone was famished. Meg knew it was too late now. Miss, the little boy said to her urgently. Meg gazed sadly at the fangs that poked from his mouth. Well, okay. That is, if you don't mind the same blood all the rest of you have, Meg laughed. There was nothing to do but laugh. That was the quickest way to settle the matter. Meg felt her fangs come out. Astonished groans swept through the shadowy figures like a wave. They backed away without another word. Goodbye, Meg told them. And then she slipped out the door. Her eyes were drawn to the figure who stood a short distance away. Duke Dio's Dandorian's cape and bandages fluttered in the night wind. Deny is destroyed, he said. Somewhere in Meg's heart, ripples of pointlessness spread. That was all. Come with me, the Duke said. Meg nodded. Okay, she said. Take me wherever you're going. At that time, Meg was fully aware that she was still in her right mind. Pitchbrick. Countless figures were coming and going at the dome. Night was the nobility's world, the solemn splendor of their fancy balls, and many other forms of nightlife had been gorgeously preserved in paintings and written accounts. However, this wasn't the clustered palaces of the capital and the shadowy figures who navigated the fairly opulent corridors and staircases in the company of the fog were all androids. Both the light fixtures and the glow of the moon spilling in through enormous windows cast long shadows behind them. That would have been unthinkable from nobles. Even in this research facility on an island at the ends of the earth, the nobles couldn't help but build a place of misleading beauty. The chilling solitude of such places had been both pointed out and analyzed by numerous scholars. There were also maintenance personnel, of course. When analytic systems tripped by sensors determined D was a foe, 
said Prithel stood ready with dimensional cannons, but each and every one of them shut down after being bathed in blue light. That glow came from Dee's pendant. After a short journey, actually just a walk, Dee reached his destination. He knew that there he would find the person he sought. First part, end.